Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the 2022 Brown Bag Lunch and Learn series. Um, today, our session is called Cope with the Slope, and we have Eve Brantley here with um, Auburn University and Alabama Crawford Extension. And in a few minutes, our um, partner, Jonika Smith, will introduce you to her and also tell you a little bit about Jefferson County Department of Health. But before we start, I just want to remind everyone that I'm Don Lee. I'm sorry that I missed y'all two weeks ago. Um, I had an outreach program, but I'm so glad to be back with y'all. And our Lunch and Learn series is um, presented by the Friends of Birmingham Botanical Gardens in partnership with City of Birmingham Stormwater Management, Jefferson County Commission, the City of Leeds, Alabama, Stormwater Management Authority Incorporated, Alabama Green Industry Training Center, Center Alabama Extension, um, Alabama Cooperative Extension and Jefferson County Department of Health. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Janika to introduce Eve to you all. Hello, everyone. My name is Janika Smith. I'm an employee with the Jefferson County Department of Health Watershed Protection Program. And the services that we have are um, with Stormwater Management Authority. SWEMA is the acronym for it. It's a group of 22 cities that share costs to meet the requirements of their National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, known as the NPDES permit. And that's issued by the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, ADEM, and the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. The NPDES permit regulates the stormwater discharges for a municipal separate storm sewer system known as the MS4 in order to protect water quality and people's health. The services includes that we provide with the Watershed Protection Program is education and outreach, water monitoring, storm drain mapping, screening and outfalls, high risk inspections, and record keeping applications. So without further ado, I would like to introduce and present to others, Ms. E. Brantley. E. Brantley is an associate professor with Auburn University of Crop, Soil and Environmental Sciences. She also serves on the Alabama Cooperative Extension Systems Water Resource um, Specialist. Um, she worked on uh, water education and project implementation at the Watershed River Basin Regional Scales, she currently serves on five extension teams, which is really awesome, aquatic sciences, agronomic crops, animal sciences, forages, homegrown, forestry, wildlife, and natural resources. Her role in these teams is to assist water projects and educational programs that include riffle buffers, stormwater management, water quality, best management practices, and water conservation. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Eve, and thank you so much for uh, being our keynote speaker here at our Lunch and Learn. It's a pleasure. Yes, Janika, thank you so much. And Dawn, thank you for the invitation. It's great to see all of you. My name is Eve Brantley. And I'll go ahead and share my slides, but I'll just tell you a little bit about how fortunate you are to have such a great resource in Janika and the Jefferson County Public Health Department. What a great opportunity to learn more about water and to work with people who really care about making your quality of life better. So I'm going to get started and we will talk about coping with the slope, but I'm gonna put it in context of what you just heard Janika talk about with water quality and how we can all have personal responsibility, personal responsibility and stewardship for it. So let's get started. And here we go. So as we do in Zoom world, I want to make sure that everybody can see the slides okay. And if at any point you have questions, I understand that you have the ability to drop those into the chat box and we'll be monitoring the QA. I have a couple of opportunities during this presentation for check-ins. So please write down your notes um, either on a piece of paper or drop them into the chat and we'll be sure to get them and I will answer them to the best of my ability. All right, so again, my name's Eve Brantley. I'm the director of the Auburn University Water Resources Center, which is funded both by the Experiment Station with the College of Agriculture and the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. Today, <clears throat> I was asked to talk with you all about gardening on a slope or coping with slopes. Um, we are not the first to have to manage steep slopes. You can see um, there are examples of ancient civilizations that have worked out magnificent ways to manage water and gardens and agriculture on very steep slopes. We're not gonna go that in depth today. Today, we're going to talk about 
some basics of slopes, uh, why some uh, really some erosion basics, uh, recommendations of plants that may be used, common stormwater challenges, and then talking about some residential practices that may make it simpler for us to manage water as it's coming onto our landscape or as it's leaving our landscape. If you're not familiar with the Water Resources Center, let me just take a moment to talk to you about some of the work that we do. We have uh, three areas of focus, which include really promoting water research across disciplines, training scientists of the future, and then things like this, bringing research and information out around the state through our extension system. Um, so the extension system sounds like many of you are familiar with it. We work across all the teams that Janika mentioned, whether it's row crop agriculture, forestry, wildlife, 4-H, we are really interested in hearing what the concerns are from our stakeholders around the state so that we can provide that programming to help solve problems based on science and the research that we conduct here at Auburn, as well as our other sister institutions around the United States. With our extension water program, you're gonna see this video later. Um, I really like to get that hands-on approach. So Zoom has been great to be able to get be able to just communicate with you all from my office here on campus. Uh, but I really enjoy also getting outside and working and talking with people of all ages about their connection with water, how they see water and what our opportunities are to understand private wells, water quality monitoring, and really unlocking the mysteries of some of the cool stuff that are in our, our streams and rivers. So speaking of that, if you aren't aware, and I hope that you are, especially you all living there in Birmingham with water, um, you know, water is such a, a topic in Birmingham, whether it's the recent flooding, uh, you've got Cahaba River, and then on times when there are droughts, you know that, um, that drinking water can be squeezed, drinking water availability and concerns with that. So in Alabama, we are truly a river state. We're a water state more than 132,000 miles of streams and rivers, which we joke at the Water Center, we say that all the time. If you were to put all of the streams and rivers in our state end to end, it would circle the earth five times. Compared with other states of our size, we have a lot of streams and rivers. You can hardly drive a mile if you don't go down a hill, look out your window, and you'll probably see a creek or a river or even a wetland area. So. We're blessed with all of this water. In fact, in the continental US, the lower 48, 10% of all the fresh water originates in or flows through Alabama. And you can see we've got the stat about the most navigable rivers. That's reflected on our state seal. That state seal of Alabama has our major rivers on it. And it was an advertisement. If you come to our state, we've got the recreation, we've got tourism. But back in the old days, we also had the ability to move goods and services to ports so that we could move commodities to and from Alabama to partners around the world. So, ah, and then with that, here are some of our major river basins. And we'll talk just a little bit about these river basins in a moment, but you all can see where you are. If you are there in Birmingham, either the Black Warrior, the Cahaba, maybe you're on the Coosa side, or maybe you've slipped down into the Alabama side of things. You'll notice also that our river basins originate outside of our state, mostly the Cahaba originates within our state. So we really look at our neighbors and depend on what's coming into our state. And we'll get to that watershed concept in just a moment. But again, I will tie this back to why we're going to be talking about water as it flows across our landscape and then how to manage that in a way that protects not only your landscape, but those receiving waters. We have an ancient landscape, we have a diverse landscape, and we've got unbelievable freshwater biodiversity. Again, up in your part of the world, this is the vermilion darter. It is only found in Turkey Creek in Pinson, Alabama. Look at him, he's gorgeous. So then uh, moving down, you can see more than 300 species of fish, 27% of all North American species. My colleague and friend, Dr. Rebecca Bearden at Geological Survey has been working with crayfish. She gave me the updated stat that we've got 99 crayfish species. I'm confident she will find the 100 species any moment now. And we've got 61% of North American freshwater mussels, not mussels, of course, but freshwater mussels, the clams and other things that you would find 
um, in our abundant and all those 132,000 miles of stream and rivers. All right, so let's move into that. So that's the framework from the Water Center. We've got a lot of unparalleled um, biodiversity, magnificent water resources, but we also have a lot of rainfall. So it's rare that I get a phone call that someone says, hey, I just want to call you today and tell you I'm really happy with water. I feel good about the rainfall today. It's usually phone calls that say, I'm getting too much water, it's moving too fast across my lawn, or hey, it's not raining at all. Uh, what are we going to do? Let's, how can we be prepared for drought? I'd love to be prepared and not reactive for drought. So as we talk about landscapes, especially residential landscapes and water, let's back up and think about how when we develop a landscape, how that changes the trajectory and the path of water. Comparing these two pictures, it's pretty simple to see. One is relatively undeveloped, one is more developed. As we change our landscapes, we change the path of water. When it rains in that landscape that's relatively undeveloped, water has an opportunity to soak into the ground. And we see there, there's trees, there's roots, there's understory, there's a carpet of leaves. So this is muting the effect of all of that storm water. We get 55 inches on average per year. Then if you look at the more developed picture, you'll notice that there's more hardscaping. And I, I recognize that this is obvious, but that influence on the hydrologic cycle or how water is moving is pretty abrupt. So as we move from more natural ground cover to more developed ground cover, we increase impervious surfaces. And you'll see there is a shift in how much water soaks in or infiltrates and how much water runs off of a property. So there's more infiltration in these relatively undeveloped areas and there's less runoff. And then when we move to more developed areas with those hard surfaces, you get minimal infiltration and increased runoff, more stormwater arriving faster. So in our typical urban environment, we have a lot of impervious surfaces. Again, those areas that don't let water soak in. So as we look at this aerial photo, we can pretty easily call out some of the, if we were all in a room together, I would have a, a great big, everybody just shout out the impervious surface that you see. We've got roads, parking lots, buildings, sidewalks, and driveways. So all of these then in, influence and change how water moves across our landscape. I'll put all these pieces together as we start talking about how we will manage that at a residential scale. Now, not only is water moving faster, so there's more runoff and less infiltration, but it is carrying with it pollutants. And this is where you heard from Danica talking about that municipal separate storm sewer system. So stormwater flows into storm drains and it collects water and then uh, it's delivered to local water, to local waters, to streams, to, to ponds, to rivers. So that polluted stormwater runoff is picking up what is on the landscape. So I'll tell you a quick story about the jugs right here. Um, a colleague of mine and I were doing a research project on stormwater toxicity. Well, it was in 2016 where we weren't getting any rain. So we created our own stormwater. There's there's recipes online for stormwater. And we went out to a parking lot on campus and we poured the, the synthetic stormwater and then we vacuumed it up. Now it hadn't rained for several weeks and this jug full of dark liquid, that's the liquid that we collected off of a parking lot. And it wasn't even that much of a parking lot. It was a couple of parking spaces. That's what's washing off these hard impervious surfaces and flushing into our streams and rivers. So the take home here is what's on our landscape can travel to our streams, which is why we have these stormwater programs that help with minimizing those impacts. Impacts like too many, too many chemicals, fertilizers and pesticides that can create harmful algal blooms. Bacteria, that's of course a threat to human health and, uh, and, and wildlife. Oils, gas, hydrocarbons, toxins that can wash off of uh, brakes, uh, tires, and occasionally people washing out their paint cans into storm drains. 
not because they hate rivers, but because they don't understand that connection between them. Increased heat of water means it holds less dissolved oxygen. And all of these together mean that there are consequences to our local stream health. So as we move down to the neighborhood scale and the residential lot scale, how we manage our landscapes influences our local water quality, whether we're at the Cahaba River, a smaller basin, or a very small part, you, we all get to play a role in improving water quality. Okay, so that's, that's my water quality information for the day. Now we're gonna move on to erosion basics. So when we start talking about coping with the slope, it's important to take a step and think about why is there a concern? All right, so erosion has three basic principles, three processes. When a raindrop falls and strikes bare soil, there is a splash. Now, please pick up on the bare soil. When a raindrop falls and hits bare soil, there is a splash. It's like a meteor hitting that bare soil. And with the splash, there's detachment of soil particles. As more rain falls and there's more accumulation of raindrops, water begins to collect in rills. All right, rills are concentrated flow of water. So we've got meteors hitting this bare soil, splashing up particles for detachment, and then the water begins to concentrate and flow. And during that flow, that's the transport of these soil particles until at some point, the slope will flatten out or the, the concentrated water hits a larger body of water and you get sedimentation and all of those particles settle out. They can settle out on land as an alluvial fan, or they can settle out into water, as you see here in this, in this creek, where there is a big wedge of sediment that has settled out. And that's not good for um, habitat, and it's certainly not good if um, you're having to treat that for surface water drinking water intakes. So again, our, our erosion basics, detachment, transport, and sedimentation it's best to try and limit detachment. So it's best to minimize that bare soil that is available for those raindrop meteors to come and splash up those particles. Um, you can see this in this hands-on experiment that uh, my colleague, Dr. Audrey Gamble has, and we take around the state to just showcase the importance of covering the soil. So you'll see in the first one that is bare red clay soil, which we have a lot of in Alabama. And as they pour that water in for the rain simulator, that splash immediately results in water flowing off that is muddy. The other container then, as you'll see in this picture, has vegetation. So simply managing our slopes and our landscape so that we keep soil covered can help us with minimizing that splash detachment that concentrates and is available to flow off. Um, and of course, minimizing the, the resulting uh, really cloudy, turbid water, turbid meaning cloudy. All right, so looking at coping with the slope, slopes then are these steep areas and, and you all in, in the Birmingham area and that, that ridge and valley, you've got some steep slopes, even here in Auburn, we've got some steep slopes. Your erosion potential is greater when you're on a slope. You also have the opportunity for water to concentrate and move down that float. So, so we want sheet flow of water where it literally is like a sheet. It's a little less erosive. There's still some erosion, but that concentrated flow starts creating those little gullies that are of concern. And you can think about your slopes as being that convex, which have higher erosion rates than the concave. All right, so let's think like a raindrop as we are thinking about managing um, gardening on a slope and coping with the slope. All right, so here's our rainstorm, here's a raindrop. So if you think about raindrops like little race cars, so first they were meteors and now they're race cars and they are zipping down that slope. They are moving fast. The longer the slope, the steeper the slope, the more energy that raindrop will pick up as it begins to concentrate and move fast, the more erosive energy. Now, I do wanna say that not all erosion is bad. I visited the Grand Canyon, Canyon, the Grand Canyon a few 
few years ago with my family, magnificent erosion spectacle. When erosion is accelerated because of changes in our landscape and it's influencing, it's influencing you, that's a concern. So how can we manage that? Well, if we think like a raindrop and let's think about how we can slow that energy down. So we've already talked about what can we do to make sure that ground is covered and it's not available for detachment. But what if we created speed bumps? What if we created terraces where we break up that slope so that the water doesn't have the opportunity to be a race car and zip down instead it might hit this little speed bump and maybe turn into a slower moving Yugo. So if we can slow that energy down, breaking up that slope so that there's not as much potential eros erosive energy, spread out that flow, keep it from concentrating, we're starting to help ourselves out as we break up that slope. So this of course is not new technology, this is terrace technology. Terraces have been in place um, in agriculture for a very long time, and some of you may already have terraces in your yard. Um, putting in a terrace, um, this is an example, I'll just show you um, here of a home site in Auburn that, that we take students to occasionally to show them terraces. As water comes down, it's perpendicular to the flow, and then you've got a, this nice area where that stays pretty wet, but these terraces, again, help break up the slope as you are trying to slow water down and spread it out. Now you can have a DIY terrace, you can do it yourself. And there's guidance online if you, um, especially I, I like to point people to use the word extension when you do a search for items so that you know you're getting um, some extension research-based information. But there are guides out there that talk about um, what you can use structurally to help build a terrace. and, and slowing down that rain so that you create those speed bumps um, uh, along the contour. Treated wood, brick, rocks, masonry. Um, I, I had a, an old residence, that old house where I, I used to live where we just used concrete blocks to help slow the water down and then we planted in front of them. Just something to help slow that water. You can cut out the area, sink stuff in and create that that uniform um, speed bump, berm, so that water can flow over it. Again, the idea is to slow the water down and have it spread out to that sheet flow so that we're not encouraging that concentrated flow. Now, if you are interested in doing this and you do look up guides, it is recommended to not, don't go greater than two feet in height. Water is very powerful um, and in fact, if you have a, a very steep and a very long slope, you may want to look into talking with a professional, someone in the landscape and design industry that can really help you understand how to design that terrace, um, how far apart should those terraces be and what should the heights be. So if you're gonna do it yourself, try to keep it less than two feet just for, um, just, I mean, for water flow, water retention. And you always wanna consider local ordinances and building codes I'm just thinking about not wanting to pull water near homes or near other structures. So there's more, as with anything, it sounds simple, but you know, you definitely want to do your homework before you uh, just go out and start working on putting in terraces, especially on steep, steep slopes. All right, so just as a, going back to this picture here. So we've got this slope. What would you do here to slow erosion? And one idea is to think about what's at the top of this hill. So a lot of the concerns with water are water is, is water flowing onto you. What is, what is that run on concern? So at the top of this hill is a parking lot. So what can we do to manage the run on? Could we construct a berm to help encourage the sheet flow and spread that water delivery out? Um, we could consider terraces to help break up that steep slope to slow the water down. We could also take a look at, if you recall, detachment, transport, and sedimentation. How can we get cover onto this site? Perhaps we could look at putting in some temporary seed and get some straw down so that we at least get a temporary ground cover while we're looking into what that permanent vegetation may be. 
Uh, we could also use erosion blankets, um, which are natural fibers that help, again, put some seed down and it protects the seed. It keeps the soil safe from that raindrop erosion and allows you to start building in then those roots. So to me, vegetation is the end goal, but what, what do we need to consider as we are starting to establish vegetation or planning for that? So thinking about what's running onto your site and then how are we going to slow that water down as it's moving along our site? So talking about planting a slope, uh, the, the vegetation and the plants that we'll be talking about, ideally you want them to establish quickly. And they gotta be tough plants because now if they're on a slope, especially a sunny slope, it's gonna be low soil moisture, potentially low nutrients if you've had a lot of, of water running across it and removing the topsoil. Um, and ideally plants that don't need a lot of TLC, that they will be low maintenance. Um, Turf grass is a tempting answer, uh, but if you've got a steep slope, mowing that slope might be a little concerning safety-wise. Turf grass also has shallower root systems than some of the other plants that we'll be talking about, and they don't really slow water down all that much. Again, thinking like a raindrop, what would be easier for you to run through? Run across this turf or run across all of these stems and leaves and um, and different, uh, it's more of an obstacle for that, that stormwater to run across a more vegetated, stem heavy and deeper roots area. So I'm not saying don't that turf grass is not ever the answer, but there are some other things to consider. And of course, every site is different. So thinking about your budget, seeds are less expensive and you definitely, if you put a seed out, I mean, you you all probably know this, you've got to make sure you've got good soil contact, that you protect that seed by getting something on top of it, like straw or maybe that erosion blanket, uh, so that they don't wash away and they don't desiccate, dry out, and just not germinate. You could consider looking at your budget, putting in plugs, you know, little plugs or bare roots in the dormant season. You could consider bare roots, which don't have a full root system but are able to get established. Um, and if it's in the summer, or uh, if you have specific plants that you're really interested in and are available at a nursery, container plants with a more fully formed root system will establish more quickly. All of these though will, although I said, let's hope we don't need TLC, as they get established, they will need to be monitored and watered so that they get those deep root systems that will help them not only hold the slope in place, but that they will thrive and continue to grow. All right, so what are some of the plants? Well, looking at some of my extension colleagues in Mississippi and here in Alabama, um, you know, it's there's a lot of options and it's up to you. Thinking about what your, what's your interest in the color palette, um, pollinator plants, height, color, texture, and then considering sunny slopes versus shady slopes. Um, so just some examples here, um, that first, the first picture is a sedum, and this is actually um, a, the, the sedum is on a rooftop garden that we have here at Auburn on the Auburn Nursing Building. It's a core, I mean, it's a beautiful green roof, and this sedum is really doing well out in this sunny, sunny environment. So that golden stone crop, um, juniper horizontalis, those junipers that are the spreading junipers, um, prostrate junipers, St. John's wort. Um, this picture below is the creeping phlox, phlox stolonifera, um, and then daylilies. So, and that's just a snapshot of some of the recommendations and the resources that I shared with Dawn that you all can go through, see what's available at your local nursery or um, what your preference is. Then on the shadier slopes, um, you know, nature has a way of, of being able to to populate even shady slopes and, and sunny slopes, things like the Southern Shield Fern, what you see here, bugleweed, um, this nice uh, dugar reptans, uh, strawberry begonia, spotted dead nettle, and then the last picture on the bottom here is partridge berry, or that Mitchell ripens. So uh, the other thing to consider, thinking back to that picture of the relatively 
undeveloped area in comparison with the developed area is that there was a nice blanket of leaves. So it is good to, to leave those leaves in mulches or place mulch out, um, pine straw, again, to help serve as erosion protection and, and potentially minimize weeds. You could consider an erosion fabric to also help with the same thing. All right, so whew, we're halfway through. We're 25 minutes in or so. I just want to take a minute, take a deep breath. Um, I can check the chat and yeah, oh, native. Okay, so I'm definitely gonna talk about native plants and, um, and Marjana, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I, I think it's coming up here when we talk about rain gardens. I, I recommend native plants. They are um, acclimated to our local conditions and they are good for local insect populations. Again, especially I have a, a very soft spot in my heart for pollinator species. So then these are just some gratuitous pretty pictures of a great blue heron at Orange Beach and frog eggs. So there we go. Okay, so as we move into managing water on our landscapes, so we've got the slopes, all right, and we mentioned run on, and we can't always control how things were planned um, and built 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago. The old days, uh, there was a focus on with that stormwater, collecting it, conveying it, and either putting it directly into a waterway or detaining it as it is introduced then into a waterway. What we are trying to transition to, um, and, it, and we can do this on a residential scale, on a larger scale, is slowing water down. So taking advantage of some of our built surfaces to make them more permeable, spreading water out and giving it an opportunity to soak back in. That helps with um, not only water quantity, slowing down that more runoff arriving faster, um, but can help with water quality too, as soil is a natural filter and can transform um, potential pollutants like what we talked about earlier with the chemicals um, and bacteria. So let's take a look at some of the opportunities then on residential landscapes to slow stormwater runoff. And we'll step through each of these, um, except for grassy swales. And uh, I'll just mention that this is a grassy swale. It's just this large area that when water comes out, again, thinking about how do we spread water out so that we get more sheet flow than concentrated flow, these grassy swales or grass waterways or, um, or even just dry creek beds and that help guide water to, to be more spread out and less erosive. So we'll talk through each of these and, and I'll just start with rain chains. Um, rain chains are a way to guide water from a roof to the ground. If you don't have a gutter system or if you would like to replace your gutter system. And you know, I now have a, a rain chain hobby where I go places and I'm like, is that a rain chain? So um, these are just rain chains that I, you know, I, I saw as I was walking by a house. And then here is an example of a rain chain. I had a chance to um, visit Guyana in South America. And so rain chains are worldwide. My neighbors have rain chains. It's, they're just, they can be fun. They can be aesthetically pleasing. And they, again, just help break up some of that, that water energy as it's flowing from your roof. Um, here's an example of a house with rain barrels. So we'll, we'll talk about the rain barrels, but then you can see they have rain chains that are guiding water to their rain barrels as it's coming off of their roof. Um, so we'll move into now rainwater harvesting. The, the rain chains are more aesthetic and they're just fun to look at, but they can also be functional as looking into rainwater harvesting. So rainwater harvesting, this is an ancient technology ancient practice um, that still holds today. Um, whether it is small scale or large scale depends on what your need is. Just some, some quick math, uh, we get, if we get 55 inches of rain a year and you know that that comes off and on, like June's been pretty dry until yesterday here in Auburn, but just one inch of rain 
can can equal you see it 1250 gallons of water that's a lot of water and if you're going to catch that much water what will you do with it hey just another kind of cool thing uh water weighs about um, eight pounds a gallon so if you've got 1250 gallons of water multiplied by eight that's 10,000 pounds of water and imagine that running across your yard so this rainwater harvesting can help, can help slow water down and also be useful for your residential use. Um, there's a lot of options. I put there those pickle barrels could be your home. Hey, you can have one, you can have uh, rain barrels that are put together. We recommend at least 42 gallons. They fill up pretty quickly. But again, having this idea, this plan for how will I use this water? I mean, it's great to fill up a rain barrel, but it's even better to be able to use it and, and slowly return it back into the system. We have examples um, all around the state of people who have invested at Little River Canyon Center, Fairhope. And, and one thing that, and I'm, I'm going to point you to a resource that will help you if you want to do it yourself. But you see that, I mean, it's not just getting water right off a roof. In some cases, you can put in a first flush diverter that helps with cleaning out leaves that might clog up your barrel and considerations of um, things like mosquitoes that might be a concern if you aren't uh, covering up your barrel. So all of these considerations then, we have a handbook um, available on the extension webpage. And I put the entire URL down here, but honestly, if you just go to aces.edu, or type in Alabama Extension Rainwater Harvesting to your favorite search engine, you will be directed to this homeowner's guide. And it helps with things like planning. Again, how do you plan to use the water? How much water will you use? Um, where will you locate the barrel? Things like making sure that, remember it weighs eight pounds, a water weighs eight, eight pounds a gallon. So if you have a lot of water, you want to make sure that you've got it secure and it's not a tipping hazard. And the higher up you place your barrel, the more pressure you have if you wanted to do a soaker hose. Mosquito control, um, tips and lessons on how to move water from point A to point B, maintenance recommendations, and then design. You can make your barrel pretty. So check out this if you're interested in rainwater harvesting, again, to help slow that water down as it's leaving your roof and then make it available for other purposes in your landscape. All right, so with that, I'll introduce our next residential practice, um, which is a rain garden. Rain gardens are designed, they're like little teacups and like just little depressions to capture that first inch of rain and allow it to soak into the soil. The important part of the catching that first inch of rain is you remember that time that we poured synthetic rainwater, synthetic stormwater on a parking lot, and then we vacuumed it up. We were simulating the first inch of rain. That first inch of rain typically carries the most pollutants. Um, I like to think about it like if you've been working out in the garden, your hands are covered, that first 45 seconds to a minute that you're washing your hand, that's even, that's probably when most of the dirt's coming off your hand, right? Or soil, I should say. So that first flush of water coming off of the landscape, if we can catch that, allow it to soak into the soil, the native soil, now we can start to make a difference with improving stormwater quality. So take a look here at a um, cross section. Um, these are saucer shaped depressions and they do pool up water, typically six to nine inches. The trick here is, we don't want them to pull up water for longer than 48 hours. So we'll talk about infiltration rates. Uh, these can be designed to catch rooftop runoff to just serve as a little speed bump in your yard in an area where there's a water path. Um, or perhaps there's just an area that you would like to take out of, of grass and just put in more native vegetation and an opportunity to catch and slow down water. So there is a little bit of a of the science behind sizing these gardens. You want to look at how much impervious area will you be capturing? Will it just be half of your roof, one quarter of your roof? Will it be a part of your driveway? 
And then what is the infiltration rate of your soil? So again, um, knowing that, and look, the, the design, the size can be anything you want. These are uh, absolutely beauties in the eye of the beholder of how you want to, to create that size garden. Um, so with these infiltration tests, again, it's important to, to do an infiltration test and if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, Eve, I wish that there was a resource that would help me understand how to do an infiltration, but hang on, because it's coming, where you will know for sure if your site will be eligible um, as is for a rain garden, or if you might need to amend the soils. All right, so plant selection. All right, so I told you, these things are going to hold rain or that pool up that stormwater for at least 48 hours hours, no more. So we need plants that can manage a little bit of flooding. They can tolerate that, but they will also then be in dry soils because we need to have that infiltration rate. So that's my, we need the tough plants. Uh, Auburn University horticulture has done some research to help inform the recommendations that we make on plants for rain gardens. Again, they can tolerate wet soils, they can tolerate dry soils. So you'll see a list here, Stokes Aster, Coneflower, Inkberry. Uh, so this is um, a design from Katie Deluski, who used to work with us. Uh, and I just gotta tell you, I love Sweet Spire. Muley grass is a champion. It is a very pretty, and you'll notice these are all native plants that we are recommending, even if they're varieties. Again, thinking about um, those, those supporting those native insect populations, and they also require less maintenance and input. All right, so just taking a look at residential rain gardens um, through the years. <laughs> so these don't require to put in specialized soil. Again, it depends on your infiltration rate as to how large you make it um, and how deep you would dig that garden. Uh, call your best friends, tell them to come over with, with a shovel. And uh, if you're going very deep, you might want to call 811 too. My friend Mitch accidentally cut somebody's um, cable line one time, and it was during a a big race and I think that caused some consternation. So always be mindful of 811 if you're digging in a spot where there's a concern with utilities. But you'll see in the middle here, um, holding water. So again, they're designed to hold water. They can be at the bottom of the land, of a hill slope, catching some of that runoff from a lawn, catching runoff just before it enters into a water body uh, or just you know, incorporated into a part of the yard. So these are, these are just, Really, they're just gardens, landscape features that are designed to help with stormwater. And here is the, hey Eve, I was hoping to get more information on how to plan, design, construct, and maintain a rain garden. This book, again, if you go, this is our extension webpage and just type rain garden, you'll be able to get a lot of information um, on this as well as other practices. This book also has a really nice list of native plants that that might help inform other parts of your yard, not just a rain garden. All right, so quick review, managing water in your landscape. If you're on a slope, we're gonna think about how do we think like a raindrop, slow that energy down, put in bumps, speed bumps, um, make sure we keep it covered so that we are not um, uh, creating that opportunity for detachment, transport, and then a, eventual sedimentation. We can look at putting in number one, a rain garden to help with some of the runoff from rooftops and driveways. Um, number two, considering rainwater harvesting to help capture and slow that water down and then use that as um, part of residential watering. We didn't talk about permeable pavements, but considering um, instead of hard surfaces, putting in concrete pavers that leave space so that rainfall is able to soak in. Um, and then lastly, more trees. Trees and vegetation, I, I didn't talk much about it, but wow, what a great interceptor of rainfall energy. Those leaves um, are just blankets of protection as those raindrops hit the leaf. Some of that rain is actually held onto the leaf. As, um, and then other rain falls, follows the stem down to the trunk. And it's like this great highway of slowing rainwater as, as the storm, as, as it rains. So, and you know this because if you've ever been caught in just a light rainstorm, 
you go stand under a tree, you don't get wet. So the more leaves layered up, the more protected our landscape is from that raindrop energy. I make it sound like raindrops are the enemy, but just thinking through functionally how to protect our landscapes and how to slow that water down. All right, so I'm ending now with just some, some more program resources for you to consider. Um, here at the Water Center, we, we have, that is my son looking enthusiastic about picking up trash. We have a lot of opportunities to involve uh, not only youth, but adults in programs to just get to know their water better and learn more about these practices. We occasionally hold workshops on how to install a rain garden, how to design a rain garden. Um, there's some great videos online through extension on designing your own rain barrel and what that might look like. Um, so just to tell you all, if you're familiar with Alabama Water Watch, um, maybe there's a water body that's nearby you or, or one that you like to visit, you can be part of a citizen science program that trains you on how to monitor water quality. Um, it's a, a great program. We we're integrated with 4-H. We work with the Forest Service. We work with everybody. It's just, it, if you're not a part of this program and you'd like to learn more, please visit alabamawaterwatch.org. Uh, we really look at removing that mystery of doing chemistry. I, I mean, if you can bake a cake, you can monitor water. If you can't bake a cake, you can monitor water quality. It's, um, it's really straightforward and it's fun to be part of a large network of people learning more about water chemistry and bacteria. Um, so like everything, um, we have pivoted to have a lot of online resources. And, and so with that, if you'd like to learn more about it, check that out, be sure and contact Mona Dominguez, who's the program coordinator, or you can send a note to me and I'll be happy to connect you with them. Watershed Stewards is a program that I have talked about all throughout this, this webinar, but I've not actually called it by name. Watershed Stewards is a program that's jointly funded through Department of Environmental Management and, and implemented by Cooperative Extension System. We uh, are able to hold workshops and priority watersheds where we talk through what is a watershed? How do I know, is that a problem? And then who do I call? The resources that I mentioned with rainwater harvesting and the rain garden, that's all part of our larger watershed stewards program. So Laura Bell, who's the coordinator, she has put together some really nice resources online um, as a Canvas course, as well as those handbooks that you see. We also have a handbook for litter pickups. Uh, that was one of our interns put together this, how do I conduct a litter pickup? And we were like, well, that won't take you much time. Turns out he put together a really nice checklist on everything to consider, including Janika working with local governments and understanding what the current initiatives are so that you can plug in and help. Or if there aren't any local initiatives, by golly, you can just do it yourself. Um, so it's a great program um, that just offers those tools for, for local groups who would like to learn just a little bit more about what they can do, including some of the residential practices we talked about today. Um, so uh, there's also a, a, a really nice thick document on water, on water and watersheds that is available for free online. And uh, that's Laura's contact information there. So I am uh, right at my 45 minutes of time that I have been talking and I'm eager to hear from you all I will share with you that, um, again, working within Extension means that we have an Extension network around the nation. Some of the information that I presented today was not only from our Alabama watershed stewards and Alabama Extension landscape materials, but Mississippi State Extension has a really nice uh, resource on gardening and steep slopes. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate you being here today. And I wish I could be there in person so that we could, I don't know, all catch up and, and talk, but I will just say thank you and I will end the show and stop sharing and look forward to taking your questions or hearing comments from you about how you have managed erosion and water resources in your landscape. Thanks so much, Eve. Um, did you have a chance to look at the Q&A comment that was put up by Juliet? Juliet? I believe. She I said, am, huh? 
Aha, I'm glad you're talking about managing rainwater. Um, yes, oh my gosh, Juliet, that, yes, what a great, so if, if you um, don't see Juliet's comment, it is um, going through, so, oh, this is great. Yeah, so if we are looking at, everything is a system, right? So if we're looking at improving soils um, by getting more roots in them, by protecting them from that raindrop energy, as you improve your soil health, you improve your soil's ability to hold on to the rain that we do get. So then your then your landscape becomes like a savings account. Um, so the healthier the soils, the longer it will be able to hold water and have plant available water. So I, I just think, Julia, that is a very good opportunity to talk about. It's not just it's not just one thing. It's a big system, and and I think starting with the soils and really thinking through how to protect those and rebuild those is a great way to look at it. I see where Tanya said that she has a list of plants that she wants to plant in her garden. What is the best place to figure out how to group or plant the plants on the slope? All right, Tanya, check out those resources. And, and um, what you might want to do is, is just sketch it out, right? Like just get a piece of paper and sketch out what you might want on that slope. Um, but so I know that I sent those resources to to Don, but take a look at those so that you can think about, um, you, it's good to group plants that have similar water requirements. That way you're managing them as a group. Um, and then thinking through, uh, again, just establishment and where, and can you get to them and give them TLC? So take a look at those resources and, and you know, feel free to contact your home grounds agent um, at top talk to Bethany or Rear, she's amazing. So I think you got some good resources locally that can help answer some of those more specific questions. And Tanya, you are gonna get an email of that resource list. It's gonna go out next Wednesday um, around 1230. So you will get those resources. Do we have any more questions? It looks like Karen Callahan raised her hand. Um. Karen, if you raised your hand, could you please put your question in the chat? Um, Marjan just said that she's in the market for a house and recently saw one where the backyard was essentially a steep hill sloping toward the house. Um, there wasn't a buffer between the slope and the house. Are there enough things I could do to prevent erosion and water damage to the house? Yeah, this so... Hey, Marjan, that's, I always tell my students, before you buy a house, go look at that house in the rain and just see, mm. see what the water's doing. Um, I, I mean, so there are, I mean, there are, and this, this gets into the more detailed design and landscaping side of things, um, but I know that there are techniques to capture that water and, and either, you know, like we were talking about berms to, to move that water away, but that, or French drain type things and terraces, but these are all things that, yeah, it's not a simple question. These are site specific that being armed with um, a little bit of information, doing some more readings and then talking, making sure that when you talk with someone, they're thinking about that water flow um, and how it's going and how you wanna keep it sheet flow and transport it safely away from your house, but also that you're not creating a problem on an adjoining property. Okay. Um, Karen asked her question in the chat. She said, if you are replacing a concrete slab pat patio, what do you recommend replacing it with? Um, we are actually talking about putting in um, something that we're looking at interlocking pavers, um, which, I mean, of course, you know, you've got to have your, your level area, but then just putting in pavers that, that leave just enough spots so that, you know, like a quarter of an inch or so. Um, so there's a lot of, if, if you go to Pinterest and you look up like, you know, permeable pavers and stuff there, there's a lot of cool designs that are really attractive. And I like, that's just a personal thing. That's what we're thinking about is um, doing some really pretty pavers and you can do designs, um, but they allow for some um, stability, you know, like you, you're able to have a solid foundation, but it does still allow for water to soak in. Um, Juliet 
asked another question. She said, can you suggest resources for mending soils that don't drain well? I did some terracing and now have standing water issues. Yeah, that, um, yeah, heavy clay soils or soils that don't drain well, that's where you start looking. And again, I'm first blush answer would be thinking about some subsurface op drainage opportunities um, and you know, like maybe a French drain or something. Or, I mean, depending on how long that it's um, the water standing there, maybe you could plant it with some wetland vegetation. There's some pretty cool wetland plants out there that um, are also extremely pretty. So I, I go to my friends in the home grounds team who um, don't fight the site. If you've got wet soils, go find the plants that like their feet wet. Um, so I have been hearing a lot of times when people say that they want to put like mulch underneath like a play area for kids or mm -hmm. if they're going to put stones down that you have to put plastic down underneath that is that good or bad i think it's a preference of okay. if you i mean i think that's just a preference for um for yeah that's just a preference i know there's there's um like um, fabric, like weed fabric or um, geotextile fabric that you can put down. And depending on who you talk to, some people really like it. And again, I'm not necessarily, um, I'm not the home grounds agent, but yeah. I think that's just a preference on um, on maintenance and and what you like. So I, I guess I don't really have a comment on that. 